Mikichi. I was a math major at Michigan Normal College as an undergrad. At that time, Ipsy only had two courses in psychology, intro psych and ed psych, and I liked those. And then I went into, then I became a Methodist minister for uh, six months, trying to decide whether or not to go into the Army or Navy or something, or to stay out of the war. And, and I went to a Methodist minister's conference and talked to the speaker, and he said, well, if the Lord wants you to be a minister, you'll be deferred. If he doesn't, you'll get drafted. So I got drafted when I turned 21. And, uh, and although I did conduct church services in the mess hall if we weren't in combat on a Sunday, and everybody who wasn't on duty would turn out because no, we were all scared. <laughs> so I'd written to my wife that I've survived. if I survived, I wanted to go into psychology because my experience as a minister convinced me I didn't need more theology. I needed to understand people better. And being on a ship with 300 very diverse people uh, also convinced me I needed to understand people better. So fortunately, I survived. And because I had lots of combat, I got out earlier than other people and was here for the fall term 1945. Been here ever since. <clears throat> and uh, when I was finishing my PhD in 1948, my best friend and I, Jerry Gurren, went to the department chair to talk about getting jobs. And he said, well, you can go any place you want to in the country with the GIs flocking and everybody's looking for faculty. And I said, I'd like to go to Sarah Lawrence or Bennington because their school is interested in teaching and I like to teach. He said, okay. A week later, the department chair said, you know, instead of going to Sarah Lawrence, how would you like to stay here and train our graduate students to teach? There wasn't another job like that anywhere in the world. It was assumed if you got a PhD, you could teach. Right. And uh, I thought it was nice to be near home. I grew up about 40 miles north of here near Holly, Michigan, and my wife was from Detroit. So I thought it'd be nice to be near our parents. and. So I said, oh, I'd be fine. And I thought I'd stay until I got my research kind of straightened out. And I got job offers every year from, well, maybe not that year, but anyway, from about 1950-some on until I was 80. <laughs> and I kept thinking I'd take one of these other jobs as soon as my research was straightened out, but I never got to the point where I thought I could leave it, so I'm still here. So, so what is the, what are the, the major areas of your research that you've... What, what, college teaching, college and university so teaching. Specifically, just like the, so like technique, and, and uh, what, what have you learned about the best way to teach? Well, the best way is to have students talk to one another rather than listening to a lecturer. They learn more from one another than they do from listening to somebody just talk, which is likely to be boring, and they sometimes go to sleep. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. I've been a victim of that myself. <laughs> so, uh, you know, even when I had 500 in a class, I'd split them up into um, it was called Phillips 66. That was a gasoline and Don Phillips at Michigan State had invented this method of teaching where you put people in groups of six to talk to one another about a problem. So during the lecture, I'd say, well, uh, uh, talk to the person beside you, on each side of you, and the persons behind you, and see you what you think might be a solution to this problem or an answer to this question. And so I'd break up the lecture by having them talk to one another and uh, that kept them awake longer at least. <laughs> That's important. Mm -hmm. so, so, for, so if someone's like trying to go and review a huge amount of information, what would, how would you, like, would you recommend doing that in the form of a group sort of discussion thing, or? Yeah, what I would do would be to divide it up hmm. and ask each member of the group to be responsible for reporting back hmm. 
to uh, the group on the section that he or she had studied. And uh, that way they actually remember it better than if they're just reading it for themselves. Because, really? you know, they've got to explain it to somebody else or talk about it to somebody else. And probably one of the best ways of remembering something is to explain it uh, to somebody and to talk about it. So you remember it yourself better after that, so it's good for both of you. As Einstein said that if you can't explain something to your mother, then you don't really understand it. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. That's a great saying. I, I, think him. I think it was him. Good. So that, that's, a, that's a great way to learn things well. Would you say, <laughs> is, there, is there a shortcut? Is there a way to learn faster or something? Or is there no royal route to learning? Well, I think the important thing is to try to relate it to things in your own life or things that you already know. Uh, certainly the worst way is just to try to memorize it. Because okay. you, you, know, you may memorize it and be able to pass a factual test, but you may not remember it afterwards very long. True. Uh, if you're trying to do too much, you just, uh, well, one thing blocks out another and you don't remember much of it. And so uh, the important thing is what you do with it rather than how much there is or what it is. Okay. So like staying up all night and just cramming for an exam? Well, it might get you through the exam if it's a factual exam, but you probably won't remember it afterwards very long. True. True. Um, so. What about sort of multitasking? Like if I wanted to say, just listen to a recording while I slept, could I absorb things that way? Is oh, a little bit, probably. I mean, depends on how deeply you sleep, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's probably not a very efficient way to learn. <laughs> <laughs>